We're going to be back over in the book of Matthew in chapter 6 this morning. We are looking at Jesus' challenge to the Israelite people. Now, uh, as you're turning to Matthew chapter 6, I've, I, I try to tell young preachers all the time, sometimes as pastors we get hung up on content. In other words, this is what the Bible is saying and, and, and different things like that. And so when Jesus is here and he is speaking about um, anxiety and worry and things like that, uh, we can take it and, and apply it to just about anything. But when you look at context, content is what? Context is why? Why is Jesus talking to the Israelites, and especially the Israelites that were in Galilee? I mean, the, these are not the ones that you would say that would, Brother Todd, look the most Jewish. Or lived the most Jewish. They were the, as far as Jews, they were the most separated from the temple in Jerusalem. They were separated from the daily reminders of seeing the priests and those who ministered and worked within the temple complex. And they were the most distanced from it. They didn't speak Hebrew in Galilee. They spoke Aramaic. And Aramaic was a blend of all the languages that were there in the area of Galilee. There was Hebrew words in there. There were uh, Greek words in there. There were uh, Persian, Babylonian, Chaldean words in there. We used the Chaldean word last week when we talked about mammon. And so these were the least of the Israelites that you would think that Jesus would be talking to about Jewish life. But this is who he's talking to. And there's a reason. It's because, and here's the context, the entire, and I've said this many times, the entire New Testament was written in the days of Roman occupation. Jews were crucified by the thousands. Those who were in conflict with Mosaic law were stoned to death. Those who were sick with leprosy did not get any kind of um, jurisprudence as far as a, a, a court or anything like that. They were put in leper colonies. They were colonized. So when Jesus is telling these folks that they had to learn how to live amongst uncertainty, He is doing this with the people who were living in a very dangerous time. A very dangerous time. And so let's look at what the Scripture says starting in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. The Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat or food, is the, and the body more than raiment or clothing? Behold. Now, when he uses that word behold, that's not just see. That word behold means I want you to understand. So behold, understand the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature or height? And why take ye thought for raiment or clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed or dressed or clothed like one of these. And notice he said one of these. In other words, one lily. 
Forget about a lily field. I mean, just one lily. He said, Solomon didn't look like one lily, okay? Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall ye not much more clothe you, O you, of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? And here's for the knockout punch. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, I know this is Memorial Day weekend, and we really, and and we have already sang the Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem, we've said the Pledge of the Flag, and we normally focus on these men and women today who have paid the ultimate price for our freedoms with their lives. I know. Uh, when I was talking about a combat soldier, I know I was talking more specifically about Brother Richard this morning. Uh, you're talking about a duck out of water. He wasn't in the army. He was in the Navy. Attached to a Marine unit. As a corpsman. And so when any kind of injury took place on the battlefield, he had to get there. And so, Brother Richard Thayer has been on the battlefield. He knows what it's like to be wounded. But he also knows what it's like to deal with death in a very real way, in a very brutal way. The men and women whose names are on the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., or on the wall that's at the rest area between Thomasville and Lexington off of Interstate 85. Those names that are on that wall are the ones that we talk about that didn't make it home. Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. commemorates the more than 58,000 Americans. The memorial that's off of Interstate 85 is more specific to those from our own state of North Carolina. And so, this message is going to have a tent of Memorial Day in the message. All this while, in Matthew chapter 5, and now as we finish up Matthew chapter 6, Jesus has given to us examples about the issues of life, problems, and then solutions. And so, Jesus would be remiss on a large scale if He also did not confront the area of stress or anxiety. And so, I hope that we understand that what we're dealing with today with COVID and sickness is not something new. This is something when it comes to uh, anxiety and stress and, and things like this. This is something that's not been dealt with by, it, in, in a matter of decades as far as a measure of time or centuries as far as a measure of time. But worry and anxiety is something that's been dealt with for thousands of years. Jesus is talking about it here. We're not experiencing something new. And worry and anxiety can literally be called a silent killer. Brother Richard, I guarantee when you were in combat, you heard the gunfire, right? Okay, it wasn't, it, they wasn't out there going, pew, 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 pew. it was kapow, bang, boom. I mean, it's all the different noises and things like that. Well, anxiety and worry is a silent killer. And it's one of the most prevalent symptoms that we've been, we've been, we've been witnessing here in the last couple of months. Even before COVID-19 existed, studies showed that anxiety and stress 
increased the chances of heart disease and stroke by 29%. Now, here's a, here's a statistic. And I got this off a of CDC website, so I'm not just pulling numbers out of there. According to the CDC, 32% of adolescents. Now, when I'm talking about adolescents, I'm not talking about teenagers. I'm talking about those young folks, the age of 12 and younger. 32% of adolescents suffer from anxiety. That's an amazing thought. I mean, when I was 12, I don't even think I knew what... The only way I knew what anxiety was when I was 12 is I knew that I'd been playing somewhere where I wasn't supposed to be playing. And when I got home, I was going to get a whooping. That was about as much as I was anxious about. Amen? 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 Uh, uh, that C, and now I know kids don't have citizenship grades anymore, but that C on my citizenship grade gave me a great amount of anxiety, and the anxiety increased because, Miss Kay, you know what I found out? On report card, no matter how good penmanship you may have, you can't take a C and turn it into an A. You just can't do it. You can't do it because I'm going to tell you why. Your dad will see it. And then he will see to it that you don't ever do it again. You know, I've told you before, my dad used to tell me, he said, now, he, he said, if you won't be stupid, you can be quiet and be stupid. Okay? Words of wisdom from Sylvester Campbell to live by, right there. Okay? But anxiety is something that even adolescents have to deal with. But here's what happens with anxiety. When anxiety becomes worry. What becomes worry? It gets ready to cross over a threshold where it's no longer concern, but it becomes sin. And here's why. What Jesus is dealing with, with Israel here in this passage of Scripture, they have begun to doubt God as provider. That His provision has now been shortened because of the influence of Rome. And because of that, it was becoming sin. See, this is where we can link Memorial Day to this message. In the military, trust is vital. Trust is vital. For that military member who is getting ready to go out on a mission, whether it's uh, it's with a ground unit, or if it's on a ship, or a submarine, or with aircraft, no matter what it may be. Trust is, is, is vital for the success of that mission. In the military, that military member entrusts their life to their fellow soldier, sailor, airman, marine. And they entrust their life to you. It forms a camaraderie that you'll never be able to get away from. It just remains. It stays there. We have to believe that when it comes to our ships, our weapons, our aircraft, whatever it may be, that it's the best on planet Earth. That our training our planning, our leadership is second to none. Because if you go into battle without trust, then you may not come back home. You have to believe in the process of what they've told you and what they've taught you, whether it was in seer training, if you were captured, or if it was under live fire, or if you went to flooding school in the Navy and they put you in a room and shut the door and you hear the doors lock and you think, man, there ain't nobody in here. Whoa, there's an observation deck under, I wonder what's getting ready to happen here. And now all of a sudden you hear valves open up, water comes flooding in and you're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, this is not good. Now you've got to remember the training that you had in damage control. You may not be able to stop that water, but you better dead sure slow it down. 
You have to trust in what you've been taught. Is it not the same in the church of Jesus Christ? When we stop trusting in what God's saying and what God said, then we cross over a threshold of concern to worry. And this is where Jesus is this morning. The soldier, the sailor has got to conquer their fear. They cannot be controlled by their fear. And it's the same thing when it comes to a Christian. It was the same thing that Jesus was telling the Jews. You may be living in occupied Israel, but your fear cannot be toward Rome. Rome will pass. Rome will go away. It's already been determined through prophecy. One of these days, Roman, Roman rule will not be in Israel. So what are we going to do in the meantime? First thing I want us to look at this morning as we look at what Jesus says about conquering our fears. He wants us to understand about anxiety over the cares of life in verses 25, 26, and 27. And so he gives us instruction there. And so when Jesus is saying and he's telling the crowds, take no thought for your life. Now here's what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying to go about living your life carelessly. Jesus was not, is not that friend. And, and, and I've shared this before. I, I, when I get in the Old Testament and I'm reading through the life of David, and David had a, a son by the name of Amnon. And the Bible says, but Amnon had a friend. I don't know about you ladies, but all of us guys, all of us guys have had that friend. That friend who just double dared you to do something. And then you turned around and looked and said those famous last words of the redneck. Hey, y'all watch this. Whether it was that he dared you to jump on the back of a bull. We had a young boy by the, uh, at the cowboy church and there was a bunch of cows laying down out in the pasture. And he had a friend. And that friend dared him to jump on the back. Of one of them cows that was laid in the pasture. Well, I get through. You want me to tell you what happened? She got up. And when she got up, he got off. <laughs> and he was twirling through the air. And his friend kept filming. <laughs> Jesus wasn't like that. He wasn't willing to say, hey, y'all watch this. He's not saying live carelessly. Here's what he is saying. I want you to live carefree. I want you to live carefree. In other words, in a nutshell, he's asking them, Israel, what are you worried about? What are you worried about? See, when it comes to the instruction of the Lord and it, 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 and, and what's found in the Scriptures, and what was found in the Old Testament Scriptures, and now what's found in the New Testament Scriptures, is we have a more complete set of writings that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Then we can look at the church, just like Jesus did in Israel, and say, Israel, you had the Old Testament, you had Isaiah, and you had Jeremiah, and you had Ezekiel. But man, we got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. We got the, uh, the, the works of the apostles in the book of Acts. We have the letters to Corinth. We have the letters to Philippi. We have the letters to uh, Thessalonica. We have the letters to the, uh, uh, to the churches of Asia Minor. And we have a more complete understanding of what God expects from the church. And so if there's been anything that I've been disappointed, not discouraged but disappointed about for the last two months. It has been the fear and the worry that has overtaken some of God's people. What are you worried about? I understand fear of death and loss, folks. I understand that. I honestly do. I understand they have no hope. The Bible tells us even when it comes to, uh, to, to sorrow and, and, and to loss of family like y'all did with Miss Carol. There's no hope. But when we came in and did Miss Carol's funeral, we could give hope because of the cross. Because the tomb's empty. What are we worried about? I understand lost folks 
being worried of dying. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 18 that they that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. There's not going to be this day. Well, you know what, Pastor? Don't worry about me because one of these days when I pass away, I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to explain to Him my specific circumstances and He's going to be okay with it. He's going to give me the thumbs up and I'm going to march in through gates of pearl and walk on streets of gold. Not if you hadn't accepted the truth, you ain't. They're going to go down into the pit and there will be no hope for the truth there. But God's people being gripped by fear, I don't, I'll just go ahead and say it. To me, it's inexcusable. Now, I know that's hard. But it's inexcusable. Anxiety, by definition, is a feeling of worry, nervousness, unease, typically about the uh, an, an, uh, imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. When you take that soldier and you get ready to send that soldier, that Marine, who, or that corpsman from the Navy, whoever it may be that's going into battle, and they look at you and tell you that they're not afraid, they're lying. They don't know who's out there. They don't know where they are. I've never been hunted by another human being. I would be lying if I said that I wasn't afraid. Jesus is saying, but you can't be controlled by your fear. Because when you do, then you forget what you've been taught. You forget what the Scripture says. You forget what Jesus said. You forgot. You forget what you learned in Sunday school and vacation Bible school. You forget what you learned at the knees of a faithful mother and a father. Jesus is telling these folks in verse 25, don't worry about what you're going to eat today. Don't worry about what you're going to drink today. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. And then he asks a very pointed question here. He says, isn't life more than meat and, and the body more than raiment? Isn't your life much more than that? He asks, what are you afraid of? What are you worried about? Christians, what are we worried about? I'm going to ask you a question this morning. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Now I want to ask you this morning. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of life? Do you believe that God the Father gave Jesus Christ the power to raise himself from the dead? Do you believe that he is ascended into the heavens right now? Do you believe that he is seated at the right hand of the Father? Do you believe that He is interceding on your behalf, praying for you right now? If He's the Lord of life, then why are you afraid of death? He's already defeated it. Now, it'd be like, you know, if I came home and told my big brother that I had a bully. And I did. One time I came home and told my big brother, me and my twin on the bus was dealing with a bully. His name was Jim. The bully's name was Jim. I said, Sam, Jim's doing this to us on the bus. And Sam said, I'll, I'll take care of it tomorrow. Well, in those days, the high school kids and the elementary kids and the junior high kids all rode the same bus. My brother took care of it. We didn't have to worry about Jim no more. As a matter of fact, Jim was very nice after that day. Our big brother took care of death. Matter of fact, he holds the keys to it in his right hand. He's conquered it. It's done. Now we're supposed to worry about murder hornets. Well, here's what Jesus did to the murder hornet of death. He reached up and he grabbed it and he pulled his stinger out. That can't hurt you anymore. See, Jesus is telling these folks... I am. My Father is. More than capable of supplying all these things that you're worried about. What are you worried about? Paul wrote these, ver- th- these words to the church of Philippi, and I purposely used the contemporary English version 
with these verses here. Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. I honestly expect and hope that I will never do anything to be ashamed of. Whether I live or die, I always want to be as brave as I am now and bring honor to Christ. If I live, it will be for Christ. And if I die, I will gain even more. He's not telling us to live carelessly. He's telling us to live carefree. See, if I live, I don't know if I've had this stuff or not. I know I've been exposed. If I live, I will live for Christ. And if I die, I will die in Christ. And so if while in this life I live for Christ, and in my death I I die in Christ, what am I worried about? Should I be concerned? Sure. Sure. You're not going to see me walking around going all through Walmart and Lowe's and everywhere else to slobber knocking with folks. You ain't going to see it. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. I'm going to respect their distance. They're going to respect mine. We're going to stay back. The only thing I didn't respect was last night at Don Juan's. I didn't respect that bowl of queso cheese at all. I'm going to tell you what right now. I dove into that thing and sinned big time. It took two, bo- it took two boxes of chips for me to get through that cheese. Oh, it was good. It was good. But that little boy looked at me. It was, <laughs> it was serving us. He said, please don't make me sick. I won't. I won't. Don't worry, buddy. I'll take care of you. <laughs> we'll be all right. Hey, look. He's not saying carelessly. He's saying carefree. Verse 26. There's discernment there. He said, behold, that means to discern, understand what you're looking at. See, anxiety is reduced with understanding. And Jesus, and this is why that I believe <laughs> these experts, Bynum Moore told me what an expert is. X means it, it, it used to be. X means used to be. A spurt is a drip of water under pressure. That's what an X spurt is. It's a drip of water. It's no longer under pressure anymore. These X spurts can't get, can't get their story straight. And so because of that, and, and, and what they understand about this disease straight, and so that has instilled a certain amount of fear in the American public. That's what's happened. That's what's happened, okay? So Jesus said, I want you to look at some things. Behold, understand, look. He said, I want you to look at one of the most familiar sites in Israel. And you've got to remember, Israel's not got a whole bunch of trees like what we do. He's talking about like what they would see in the Garden of Gethsemane and the trees and the birds flying amongst the Garden of Gethsemane and the way that they flew up amongst the, the lofts of the sky. And they just didn't seem like they had any concern. There wasn't any birds sitting on the olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane and say, oh, I wonder if there's a worm today. I wonder if there's a bug today. I wonder if when I flap my wings, if I'm not going to fly today. They're just flying about, enjoying the creation and the provision that their Father is providing for them. And Jesus asked in verse 26, He says, ain't you better than that? You're better than the birds of heaven. In verse 27, He talks to us about Length. Now, we're talking about here, he's talking about stature, length of me and you. That's not what he's literally talking about here. When he talks here in verse 27, he said, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit? That word cubit is handbreadth. Handbreadth. Things were measured in handbreadths in those days. Horses today are measured in handbreadths. What he's talking about here is what are you going to do that you can control to lengthen your life? I'm five foot nine. I ain't getting no taller. I can stand there and think about it all I want to. I ain't getting no taller. 
I shared my avatar with Pat the other day. I want y'all all to know, all of y'all who have sat at home and created an avatar, y'all look alike. That's all I'm going to say. Pat sent me my, I sent Pat my avatar the other day and she said, you look old. I said, I am old. She said, your hair, your hair looks gray. I said, my hair is gray. She said, well, your goatee is too gray. I said, my goatee is gray. Your glasses look like a grandpa's glasses. I'm a grandpa. They are grandpa glasses. I am failing to see where it don't look like what it's supposed to look like. Okay? I can't lengthen my days. I cannot lengthen my days. I saw somebody put a a meme on Facebook the other day and it said, uh, Brother Richard, I got tickled when I saw it. It says, this only happens once in history. At 8 o'clock, it's going to be 20 hundred hours at 20 minutes at 20 seconds in the year of 2020. It's 2020, 2020, 2020. It only happens once in history. I came back and put up there and said, no, it's going to happen the same time tomorrow. Tomorrow at 20... 100 hours, that 20 minutes after, and 20 seconds after that, and it's still going to be 2020. Tomorrow it's going to be 2020, 2020, 2020. I said, guess what's going to happen day after tomorrow? Boy, look at Tommy figure that thing out. Hey, man, it's going to be the same. I said, and it's the only time it's going to happen in history. I said, no, nah, it's going to happen 101 years later. It's going to be 21, 21, 21. 21, 21. They're going to be celebrating that. I'm going to be dead. I can't lengthen my days. And neither can you. David wrote in Psalm chapter 39 and verse 5, he said, Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 and verse 26, So if ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, and he height, then why take ye thought for the rest? What do we worry about it for? Next thing is to be anxiety about their clothing of leisure in verses 28 and 29. And last week we talked about money uh, here at Park Place. But in Israel, the clothing of the Jew was the external indicator of your personal wealth. If you wore fine clothing, then you were a person of financial means. One of my favorite movies always has been, always will be, The Sandlot. I love that movie. I can watch it. Uh, over and over again. And one of my favorite scenes in the Sandlot is when that the worst player on the field, Scott Smalls. I mean, you're talking about a, 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 a duck out of water. He's out there in left field. He don't know how to throw. He don't know how to catch. He don't know nothing about the game of baseball. All he knows is, is he wants to play. Well, the best kid on the field, his name is Benny the Jet Rodriguez, and he's out in left field, coaching up Smalls. Trying to tell him how to throw the ball, how to catch the ball. And, and he told him, he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you just to take your glove and stick it up in the air, and I'll take care of the rest. Then he turns around and trots back into the infield, and another little boy, his name was Squints, and he yells out, Hurry up, Benny, my clothes are going out of style. And quickly another kid chimes in. He said, they already are. Jesus is telling these folks, what you worry about your clothing for? One of these days, it's going to go out of style. I got tickled. It's last year. I don't know if they're still doing, got, still got them for sale this year or not. But at the Cowboy Church, we got tickled because you could go online and buy a pair of blue jeans. It looked like you'd been out working in the mud. But it's going to cost you $85 to order, uh, to, uh, to wear a pair of jeans that look like you've been out working in the mud. Well, you could buy a cowboy hat and went along with it, Miss Kay. Brother Dale, I know you got a cowboy hat. It cost you $300 to have a cowboy hat that the bills already broke down with a sweat stain around the brim. 300 bucks. So for $400, you can have a pair of mud covered jeans and a sweaty looking cowboy hat for almost $400. It's going to go out of style. It's going to go out of style. Hopefully one of these days, these men with their hair put up on their head, it's going to go out of style. Hopefully. 
Amen. But I'll tell you something that's never out of style. Jesus said, look at the lilies. Look at the lilies. Look at how they grow. Look at the ease from which the bulb pushes the new shoots up through the ground. Every spring when the ground warms up. I want you to look at the beauty of that one blossom. The intricate weavings and the color patterns and the, the way that it's just made and, and it, with such care and with such detail. And when you get up close to it, then you smell the fragrance that comes up from it. Jesus said, I'm going to tell you right now, Solomon never looked that good. Solomon never looked that good. That word consider there in verse 28, it means to note carefully, to learn thoroughly. Jesus is literally saying, you can learn how I want you to live by looking at a flower. The flower of the lily doesn't come up carelessly in the winter, but carefully in the spring. And when it comes up out of the ground, it bursts up out of the ground with a beautiful confidence. That I want you to study and learn from. Let me tell you something, folks. Faith, courage, and trust in the Lord will never go out of style. Ever. It'll never go out of style. Psalm chapter 4 and verse 5 says, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Then lastly this morning, they are going to need to listen to this one. We looked at cares of life, clothing of leisure. Now we're going to look at, con- uh, we're going to look at con- consumption of lentils. A little weird, isn't it? But I needed something to start with an L. Amen? That's what I needed. But there's purpose in just a few moments. When Jesus is talking about here about the grass of the field that today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, he's not talking. Now, he had talked about the rich when he was talking about the clothing. Now he's talking about the poor. The poor went out and harvested grass and put grass in their clay ovens. And that's what they cooked with. And when I think about ovens and cooking and lack of faith and trust, I can't think of but one person that really stands out in the Scriptures when it comes to the temporary things. Esau. Esau. I want you to think about Isaac's son, Esau. Jacob's twin brother. His oldest brother, Esau. When Esau was born, the birthright was his. The blessing of the father was his. Now, God had already told Jacob, I mean, Isaac and Rebekah, that the younger child was going to excel above the elder. But God didn't in any way ask Rebecca or Isaac or anybody else to help him out. He's going to handle it himself. But they helped him out. And the Bible tells us that Esau came in from the field. He'd been out hunting. And there's his brother cooking pork and beans. And he traded his birthright for pork and beans. And the New Testament tells us about Esau in Hebrews chapter 12. Now that's important because in Hebrews chapter 11, man, you got the all-star list of faith. And over here in chapter 12, Paul writes about Esau. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now I want you to look at verse 32 again. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Here's what God is tell- Here's what God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, is telling them. You are... Israel, 
your Father. You are the nation that God Almighty chose out from all the nations on the face of the earth. You and you alone have a national name for Him. And His name's Jehovah. If you remember back in the days of David when the Philistines heard the shout uh, in the days of Saul when they heard the shout of the armies of Israel, the Philistines said, the God of Israel has showed up. The Ark of the Covenant has showed up. Jehovah showed up. Jesus said, you are Israel. You are a chosen people. You have been called out from all of those and, and you are the people of which my Father has promised a land that's filled with milk and honey. You are the people to whom my Father has sent Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the prophets. It is to you, my people, that He has sent His only begotten Son. You are Israel. Folks, you are the church of Jesus Christ. You are the redeemed of the entire world. If you're born again and bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, by what the Apostle Peter said, you are a peculiar people that's been called out of darkness into a marvelous light. So that you might show forth the praises of Him. The One that called you out. You are the church. We are the church. We don't bow. No more than what the United States dips in its colors to another country. We don't dip our flag to nobody. Those Hebrew boys. Those Hebrew men. Told Nebuchadnezzar, we will not be it. We will not bow. We will not bow. We are the church. We are the church. Who are we bowing? Who are we bowing? To, when we bow to, to fear. When we bow to fear. This Memorial this Day. This Memorial Day. I remember my brother Jerry. I remember Jerry, my brother Jerry. Who on July the 25th, July of, 1967, the 25th of 1967 was the first was the one first that was one supposed, to go out that of the supposed to go out of the helicopter. And as soon as that helicopter as as touched, that down, helicopter on touched down, road, down on the side of a hedgerow, a Viet Cong soldier, a Viet came, out soldier came out and threw a hand grenade into the helicopter, that, the was helicopter that was filled with soldiers. That was filled with soldiers. He didn't think about he it. He didn't think about it. He didn't pray about it. He didn't it. pray about it. He didn't worry about he it. He didn't worry about it. He took the grenade, he held the it grenade, to his chest, held it to his dove chest, out on the ground, dove and, died on the at ground and died at twenty. No fear. No fear. We are the church of Jesus we Christ. We don't, bow at, the Christ. Altar we don't bow at the altar of fear. No one's saying to live no carelessly. No one's saying to live carelessly. But we should live carefree. We should live carefree. Jesus didn't send Jesus us. Jesus didn't send us into a safe space. Into a safe space. He sent us into sent a, world, us filled into with a world filled with danger. And one of these days, and one of these days, we're going to walk on the streets of gold, and we're going to walk past gold, John, who was poisoned, who was poisoned, beaten, beaten, imprisoned, imprisoned, boiled and all, boiled and, and all, exiled, and exiled. We're going to walk past we're gonna his, walk brother past James, his brother James, his brother James, that was beheaded. We're going to walk past Polycarp. Walk past Polycarp. That was burned. That was burned at the stake. At the stake for his faith. For his faith. We're going to walk past the We're founding fathers of this great land. This great many land. of them who signed, the declaration, who signed of the declaration of Independence. Who lost everything? Who lost everything? For our freedom. For our freedom. What are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? Folks have paid the price. Folks have paid the price for our, for our faith. For our freedom. That's what I said. I'm not saying to live carelessly. I'm not saying to live carelessly. And I hope that you what I'm saying this morning, saying not, this morning not, not as anything that's personal on my part. This is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. saying to Israel. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. My father's going to take care of you. My father's going to take care of you. It's been taken care of. It's been taken care of. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us, my faith, 
my one of these days it's going to run its course. It's going to be over. I'm going to draw my last I'm breath. My, last my heart's going to beat the last time. My mind's going to think. My last time. The last of my words on this earth is going to pass. And I'm going to stand before the Lord. It's a determined. It's a determined. A determined appointment. A determined appointment. But until that time until comes, that time comes, I'm gonna live for Christ. I'm gonna live for Christ. And when I die, I'm gonna die, die, I'm gonna die in Christ. And then I'm gonna go to heaven. And then I'm gonna go to heaven. I don't lose. I don't lose. I don't lose. I don't lose. Henry Ward Beecher says, Henry Ward every Beecher tomorrow has to every handles, tomorrow we can take handles, hold of it. Take hold of it with the handle of anxiety or the handle of faith. Or the handle of faith. Now we got you. Now we got you. Peter reminds us Peter again, reminds that we are again, that we are a peculiar people. Not much praise Not goes much on. Not much praise goes on in a house of fear. In a house of fear. Let's praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord for His goodness. For His goodness. And for our faith and our opportunity. For our faith and our opportunity. If you're here this morning, you've never opened up your heart. Never open up your heart. Time to let go of your fears. Time to let go of your fears. And even if that means fear, what that people might fear say, what people might say about you, if you become a believer, if you become a believer, no fear. What are we worried about? What are we